Hello. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the short-term causes of the First World War. And by, by short-term, we're going to move away from those long-term trends we talked about uh, in the previous video, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism, to now come to the more immediate and pressing issues that ultimately get us to war in August of 1914. So we're talking in the, in the years and then like literally the month uh, leading up to the First World War. Uh, we have to start this conversation in the Balkan Peninsula. Please know the Balkan Peninsula, uh, southeastern Europe. Uh, today, countries of, of Serbia and Bosnia and Croatia and Bulgaria and Romania, uh, Greece. Um, that's where this story is going to begin. This is a strategically important region uh, to, to Russia and Austria-Hungary. They're former Ottoman Empire lands, but as we already mentioned, the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire has been receding for, for most of the last century or more by this point, which is leaving a lot of these Balkan areas now with new independence. In particular, we're going to focus on this nation of Serbia, smack dab in the middle of the Balkan Peninsula. Uh, this area is mostly Christian, though obviously with the Ottoman Empire having been there, there is a sizable Muslim minority. Um, and, and you don't always have national groups living with their national counterparts. For example, Serbia is a national entity. It's a, it's a country, it's an independent nation of its own, but not all Serbs are living inside Serbia. Some are living within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, some are living within a region called Bosnia that we're gonna talk about more in a moment. Everybody's got some interest in this area. Austria-Hungary sees the Balkan Peninsula as a place that it can grow into as, as the Ottoman Empire is receding. But then we also want to talk about Russia uh, up in the, uh, the, the northeast of, of this region. Um, Russia has long desired a warm water port. And, and Russia is very hopeful that their alliances and friendship with some Balkan peoples might give them that access to the Mediterranean Sea uh, that they, at this point in their history, don't have. Now, the, the national rivalries or nationalist issues um, particularly impact a country like Austria-Hungary. And, and here's where we want to start talking about the Bosnian crisis of 1908. And we can see Bosnia um, down in um, the southern part of this map, the, the little blue part of that map, just south of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Both, this was former Ottoman lands, um, both Austria-Hungary and Russia were very interested in, um, in this question over Bosnia. But in 1908, Russia is not in a very powerful position. Uh, as we're going to talk about in a, in a later date, uh, Russia just got out of losing a Russo-Japanese war in 1904 and 5, um, and they, they had practically a revolution in Russia in 1905. So Russia is not exactly in a, a strong position. So ultimately, a deal is made between Russia and Austria-Hungary where Bosnia can be absorbed into, into the uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire and, and Russia concedes to that. Um, in turn for Russia getting access to, to go through shipping lanes from the Black Sea into the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea there. Um, the Serbs are not happy about this situation because the Serbs wanted Bosnia for themselves. The Serbs had hoped that Bosnia with its own Serb minority population might be able to come in and be a part of the Serbian nation, what, what they would call Greater Serbia. Uh, but Germany is giving Austria-Hungary support in this, in this deal and ultimately Russia backs down. A few years later, there is an actual war in this region as other Balkan peoples supported and uh, by Serbia are going to continue to try to push the Ottoman Empire further back into the background um, away from the Balkan Peninsula. Out after these successful Balkan wars, Serbia is going to be growing in strength, which is greatly intimidating to many others in the region particularly Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary does not want a strong Serbia on its southern border, especially as Austria-Hungary knows it now controls Bosnia with a lot of Serbs in it. And those Serbs in Bosnia and Serbs in Serbia, many of them want to be a part of one nation. 
So um, Austria, in turn, is going to try to stick it to the Serbs to try to try to slow their growth by supporting the creation of an independent Albanian nation. And you can notice Albania on the map uh, right next door to Serbia. And it's basically going to serve as a, a state that can block Serbia from getting to the Adriatic Sea, um, from getting to the, uh, the coast. So this is not going to make Serbia happy. We've got a big rivalry forming between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. As we push on, now we come to the most pressing and most immediate event leading to the First World War, and that is the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And here's where we want to take a closer look into the, the ethnic breakdown of, of Austria-Hungary. This is not what we would call a homogenous culture or where, where, where one ethnic group makes up the majority of the population. Austria-Hungary is very much divided with many different ethnic groups living within it. Franz Ferdinand is the Archduke. He is the, the heir apparent to the Emperor of Austria-Hungary, a man named Franz Joseph. Franz Joseph doesn't have a son. His nephew, Franz Ferdinand, is the next in line. Franz Ferdinand has some big ideas for what can happen within the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Part of what he's looking for is the creation of a more federal system, kind of like we have in the United States, where there's shared power between a, a central government and more regional, or like in our case, state governments. This is what the Archduke wants, but he's getting a lot of flack from conservatives in Austro-Hungarian Empire who don't want to give up that central authority to even some minority groups in particular, some Serbs in Austria-Hungary, and from outside the country of Serbia. Their fear is if he offers this federal system, if he gives some more local control and local autonomy to local people and lets them do what they wanna do so long as they pay the taxes and keep their peace, if he does that, that might calm a lot of the ethnic disputes happening within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that is the last thing that Serbia wants. Serbia doesn't want the Serbs in Austria-Hungary to be happy with their situation, right? Serbia wants the Serbs in Austria-Hungary to break free and, and become a part of a greater Serbia. And so according to some radical Serbs, the Archduke has got to go. So the Black Hand. The Black Hand is a Serb nationalist terrorist group, if you will, um, that is formed in 1911 with the expressed goal to use violence in order to try to gain independence for Serb lands, what they feel are Serb lands within Bosnia that could become a part of a greater Serbia where all Serbs are gonna be able to live together. This, this group um, orchestrates an attack on the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife next to him um, on July, or pardon me, June 28th, 1914. This is a date that you might want to know because you can kind of get the ball rolling for everything that's going to happen between this date in June and ultimately the start of World War I. Uh, the initial bombing attempt, the actual plan for the attack was a failure and the Archduke survived unscathed. Um, Gavrilo Princip, this, uh, this young man, a teenager at the time, uh, who was one of the assassins, uh, was dejected and felt like, it felt like he blew his opportunity um, until by a fate of luck, he happened to be sitting at a corner when the Archduke and his wife's car pulled right next to him. He pulled out his revolver, he fired two shots, and both the Archduke and his wife will be murdered. This begins what is known as the July crisis. Austria-Hungary is furious with the nation of Serbia, who they blame for this assassination. Austria demands that they be allowed to go into Serbia to investigate, because there's feeling in Austria that this crime is going to go to the highest levels of government in Serbia. Obviously, Serbia protecting what we would call their national sovereignty, their right to be an independent nation. You can't just come letting other countries come in to do investigations in your country. So Serbia does not allow this investigation to take place. That's when Austria goes to their ally. Uh, remember the, the dual alliance we mentioned. Austria goes to their ally, Germany, the, the most powerful nation on the continent. 
and Germany will issue what is known as the blank check. The blank check, uh, it's, a, it's a figure of speech that refers to um, you know, a, a check that any amount can be written on it. You can do basically anything you want. So essentially Germany is telling Austria, hey Austria, you do you. You do whatever you need to do to, to deal with Austria, to deal with Serbia, and we've got your back. Following the issuing of that black check, blank check, Austria will issue an ultimatum to Serbia, basically allow these investigations to take place um, or, or else. Um, as you can imagine, this is not going to be met uh, in the affirmative by, Austria, or by uh, the country of Serbia. And so immediately um, upon the, the, the end of, of this ultimatum, uh, Russia, who is an ally of Serbia, Russia that had hopes of moving into the, the Balkan Peninsula to gain more control and to gain that access to the sea, Russia mobilized their army on July 31st, 1914, uh, as Serbia failed to meet Austria's ultimatum. This now starts the clock ticking for Germany because Germany's Schlieffen plan, Germany's war plans to deal with both France and Russia simultaneously, if they ever were in a war, is based on strict timetables of German trains that are gonna make their way across the country. So, so France can be knocked out of the war and then German trains and troops can make their way across the country to meet the now invading Russians. That was the plan. They've got 42 days, they believed, from the mobilization of the Russian army to execute uh, or to defeat France and get back across the country. So this forces Germany's hand now to declare war on Russia um, on August 1st, 1914. On that same day, France will mobilize their army and get ready to execute their war plans. Germany, two days later, invaded Belgium to launch the Schlieffen Plan. Belgium on their way to France. That's August 3rd, 1914. And then finally, on the next day, Britain, in response to the invasion of neutral Belgium, Britain will declare war on Germany on August 4th, 1914. So there you have it, the uh, short-term causes of the war, uh, conflict and, and ethnic strife in the Balkan Peninsula, followed by an assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and we will see you next time.